Supper, and we're very excited to kick it off on this day. Um, today marks the 151st year of the USS Monitor Battle, where two sailors were lost at sea, and we will be honoring their legacy and service today at Arlington National Cemetery. Um, you can kick it off, Dave, introduce yourself and talk about um, a little bit about your role, and then we will go and introduce the panel here at um, Joint Base Myers. Great. Thank you. thank you, Sandy. I really appreciate it, and uh, thank you, everybody, for joining us today. We're, we're clearly uh, excited at the opportunity to, to, first and foremost, recognize and honor these sailors who, uh, whose uh, remains were pulled up with the turret of the monitor, uh, and that it's appropriate that we recognize them as the heroes and the, and the service members, and, and uh, that we treat them with respect and dignity. And, and I'm very grateful, and as, as a former sailor myself, very uh, impressed with the Secretary of the Navy and, and NOAA and everyone's care and diligence in, in really making this happen. So it's a tremendous opportunity. I'm struck by the use of technology and, and how we're doing the same thing we've always done, just doing it better and faster and, uh, and more efficiently. Uh, and it's not unlike it was 151 years ago. I work at the Naval History and Heritage Command. It's the place where uh, we put all of our archived information, artwork, artifacts, everything else on behalf of the United States Navy. And the reason we exist there is to make sure that the Navy not only learns from what it's done in the past and that the country can learn from what, it, what it's done in the past. As a maritime nation, three quarters of the world is covered in water. It's also to understand what we did right in the past and how by bringing that stuff forward, making that information available, that we as a country learn and that we're stronger and that our interests are represented not only here at home but abroad. And the USS Monitor is an example of one of those things that our country did right. Um, you know, 300 years of shipbuilding with wooden ships and sails and, and the way that we'd always fought battles. And 151 years ago, really tomorrow, when they actually engaged, the, we know them as the Monitor and the Merrimack. Uh, it was largely a draw, but what it did do was signify for our country at a time of terrible turmoil between the North and the South and our country trying to reconcile who it, who it was and who we were as a people, uh, that technology moved us as a country forward a generation that day, 151 years ago, uh, really tomorrow. Um, the men in the monitor and the effort that's gone to preserve and respect uh, the site where they are are representative of the type of revolutionary thinking that's made this country great. In the case, in our case, for the Navy, it helped us recognize the importance of technology in not only achieving but sustaining our interests. So, the lessons we learned from the Monitor and from that era of the importance of defense and and simple things from propulsion to low water lines to a rotatable turret, all those things and that thinking still have applications today in terms of uh, how we shape and build and procure and man and and fight our ships and our aircraft and our submarines and, and uh, you know and you think of the advances that same type of innovation is happening today so I think there are lessons and, and I'm looking forward to hearing from the group and certainly the, the people that have invested so much in caring for this ship and for our sailors uh, and, and learning a little bit about yesterday so that together we can, can better understand tomorrow. So with that, thank you. Uh, I'm Dave and look forward to talking to everybody. I'll go on mute. Hi everybody, I'm uh, Matt Dozier. I'm an outreach specialist with NOAA's Office of National Marine Sanctuaries. Um, we have folks here today uh, representing the Monitor National Marine Sanctuary. Um, and, and the story of how the USS Monitor's rec site became a National Marine Sanctuary is a pretty interesting one. So uh, it, it sank in uh, 1862, so December 31st, 1862, off the coast of North Carolina. And uh, it went down with, uh, with 16 lives lost. Um, the, it was being towed. Uh, this is at, well after the um, it, its famous battle with the Mon with the Merrimack. Um, it wasn't really meant to be a seafaring vessel, so 
the Union Navy wanted it to go south and uh, take part in the war down uh, uh, further down the coast. And uh, so the USS Rhode Island was towing it uh, off Cape Hatteras, and uh, it got caught in a really bad storm. Uh, that was the morning, early morning hours of uh, December 31st. Um, and it just, uh, it was swamped by, you know, huge seas, um, the winds were, were really intense and we, uh, they, they were only able to rescue, um, you know, a, a, the majority of the crew, but, but still many lives were lost. So for almost, uh, more than a century, the wreck was, uh, lost at sea. Nobody knew where it was. Um, it wasn't until 1973 that, um, Duke University uh, mission went out and was able to do some sonar mapping. They found something that looked like it might be the right shape and size to be the monitor. Um, and in 1974, they went back and uh, did some uh, dives and actually confirmed that it was the wreck of the monitor. Um, and then people started to worry, though, this is 1975 or thereabouts, that uh, you know we found this incredibly important vessel in our nation's history. I mean, this is one of the most significant uh, ships in, in all of, of naval history um, changed the course of naval warfare and shipbuilding for for you know, for the rest of um, uh, our history. And so uh, people were worried that even though it was well offshore, it's about 16 miles off the coast and 230 feet of water, um, there were still concerns that, that it could be uh, looted, uh, there could be unwanted salvage people, you know, looking to get a piece of history and take it home with them. Um, and so it just happens, you know, it was almost a fortunate circumstance that in 1972, this act called the National Marine Sanctuaries Act had been passed. Um, nobody really kind of, nobody knew how to use it quite yet. Um, it, so it's passed in 1972, and in 1975, we're suddenly looking for some way to protect this wreck, this uh, shipwreck on, on, the, um, on the bottom of the ocean. Um, and so there was a, a, a congressman who actually said, let's use National Marine Sanctuaries Act. Let's make it a sanctuary. And people said, well, you know, it wasn't meant, it wasn't meant for that. That's not what it was supposed to, what the National Marine Sanctuaries were supposed to do. But there was almost a sense of, well, why couldn't we? And, you know, why shouldn't we protect this, this really important historical artifact? And so, um, they were able to get it done. They made it a National Marine Sanctuary. So in 1975, it became the first National Marine Sanctuary. Um, we now have uh, 14 sites across the um, up across the U.S. Uh, ocean and Great Lakes waters. Um, and so when uh, it became a National Marine Sanctuary, suddenly it has it has more protection. Um, and and the sanctuary also works as a uh, mechanism to help share the stories of the USS Monitor. Um, and to help preserve it and, and preserve those stories and that uh, and the wreck itself. Um, in 2002, uh, there were concerns that the wreck was starting to deteriorate. Um, it's when it sank. It well, the researchers think that it might have sank stern first and sort of flipped over and it landed upside down on its turret. Um, well, the turret it was starting to look like it was in pretty bad shape. In 2002, NOAA partnered with the U.S. Navy to go out and, and recover the turret, which was an incredibly difficult, really amazing uh, expedition. You can see pictures of it online. They used this giant like claw crane to grasp the turret after they had freed it from underneath the boat um, and managed to pull it up. This thing weighed tons and tons and tons. It took them um, 40, I think it was a 41-day expedition. So they brought it up and found that uh, when they began to begin the process of restoring it, there were two, uh, the, body, the remains of two sailors inside that went down with its, with its sinking. And those are the two sailors that we're, uh, we're here to, to honor today. Um, in, I, I will say in uh, just last year, in 2012, we also dedicated a, a monument at the um, uh, Hampton National Cemetery um, to, to honor the, the rest of the, the, the crew of the USS Monitor. So um, that's why we're here today and how, how we've become involved in this. And um, it's a real honor to, to be representing National Marine Sanctuaries at this event. Um, Matt, from Hampton Museum. 
Yeah, uh, my name is Matthew Ng. I'm the Deputy Director of Education at the Hampton Roads Naval Museum. I'm also the coordinator for the Civil War Navy Sesquicentennial, and that's a, a Navy commemoration focusing on honoring the 150th anniversary of the American Civil War. Um, and what I wanted to talk about today was specifically about the, the USS Monitor and the memory of the, its sailors and really of the ship that has lasted 151 years now. And I think uh, today is a, is a great point to give it a final resting place for the two sailors um, that unfortunately have yet to be identified, but hopefully with time we'll be able to do that. Um, you know, going back 151 years, we think about the USS Monitor and really the, the Battle of Hampton Roads itself that involved the USS Monitor on its second day uh, is something that is, uh, I think, amazing because it wasn't even supposed to happen uh, when uh, CSS Virginia, uh, his, their uh, captain, Buchanan, goes out. Everyone thinks it's a shakedown cruise. Uh, what ended up happening is they take out uh, two warships. They take out the USS Congress and USS Cumberland and will eventually uh, have the USS uh, Minnesota be saved by USS Monitor. And the, the genesis of the Monitor, I think, is, is very interesting. Um, when, when the war starts and Guysport Naval Yard down in my neck of the woods was destroyed, they raised the uh, hull of the Merrimack and make it the Monitor. That's why, or, I'm sorry, the, the Virginia. That's why some people confuse themselves with, is it the Virginia, is it the, the Merrimack? Uh, down in Hampton Roads, a lot of people were talking about the public memory of it. Uh, they call it the Monitor Merrimack Bridge Tunnel. So I think it just has that nice alliteration that, and so people will recognize that. But when the ironclad board meets and they, they end up choosing designs, Monitor wasn't part of that design. One of the designs was the Galena. And so Bushnell goes up to Brooklyn to get uh, John Erickson's okay on it to say, hey, is this ship going to float? Um, so just by happenstance, he shows, Erickson shows him the design, and they end up accepting it, which is fantastic because Erickson himself was kind of a pariah in the U.S. Navy's eyes. There was a, an incident that happened years before the war uh, that killed the Secretary of the Navy. So he, even though Erickson was somebody who had a history of the Navy with their designs, I think that it's the fact that, one, the, the Monitor is, a, is our Navy's first ironclad warship, even though the CSS Virginia was built before. Um, two, it was built uh, quite fast, something the Navy and you know contractors could take note for $275,000 in less than 100 days. This thing is made up in, in Greenpoint, New York. It uh, barely survives its way down here to Hampton Roads. And most importantly, I think really talking about the memory of the Civil War, you know, here in Virginia, every kid, and I think across the United States, every kid learns about the battle between the Monitor and the Virginia. And they, they learn mostly about the second day of the battle, the battle between the two ironclads. Um, and when we're talking about this, we think about the legacy of what the war means to these sailors. And for sailors, as opposed to the soldiers that are on land, you know, soldiers on land are fighting for, uh, you know, very different, uh, very amounts of causes there you know, for the states, uh, for their country, but for the, the sailors that are involved in the American Civil War, you know, they have, you know, they have a, an ensign and they have a naval jacket and that's it. There's no states that they are, you know, there's no iron brigade or anything like that. They represent the United States Navy. And so what the United States Navy was representing and upheld during the Battle of Hampton Roads was the supremacy of the Atlantic blockade. And I think that's important. The USS Minnesota was upheld and it was saved um, with the help of the USS Monitor. Now, talking about the, the memory of USS Monitor from 1862 to the, the present day, uh, it's amazing how often the USS Monitor pops up. Um, a couple years ago, Mariner's Museum had a fantastic exhibit called Up Pops the Monitor, which talked about the, the popular culture and its impact with USS Monitor. There was Monitor refrigerators, um, tons of novels about it, uh, there was, uh, there's been video games that have been published that relate to the monitor's design, um, and it was all there. I, I, I'm actually not sure if it's still there now, but uh, in the Hampton Roads Naval Museum where I work at, there's a great lithograph that has a picture of the, the two days battle lumped into one. And it would seem like it's just a regular just lithograph just showing the, the details of the battle, but what it is below there, it's actually an advertisement for um, agricultural products, and it says this is kind of like an ironclad promise that this, this, these stuff, these materials are going to work. Um, and and Marin Museum, they, they they really nailed it on the head with their slogan about the Monitor Center, saying that it's an ironclad promise of adventure, uh, and it really is. If you guys haven't been to the the Marin Museum or to the Hampton Roads Naval Museum down in, in Norfolk, Virginia, 
um, definitely go see that because we have a lot of artifacts, um, either from the monitor or from the Battle of Hampton Roads. Um, but uh, the the monitor, actually more so than CSS Virginia, um, talking once again about the memory, there are uh, many ships involved in the Navy's history. But some famous ones, USS Constitution, USS Enterprise, either CB6 or 65, um, but USS Monitor has to be put up there with it. It's an iconic ship. It's one that uh, captures the attention of the entire world in 1862. I think people forget that there was a uh, separate arms race going on at the time of the 1860s between France, England, and really the United States. Well, the United States wins with Monitor, and that's something that resonates into the 20th century. Um, that our design of USS Monitor, its, it's, uh, its iron warship that is a rotating turret, becomes a rubric design for dreadnoughts, for battleships, for everything uh, since then. And I think that uh, if you go on our the Civil War Navy's blog, you'll notice that the top search is USS Monitor, and it's getting a lot of web traffic right now by you know, several hundred thousand searches. There's uh, a lot of searches that go on in Google, but USS Monitor is, I think, number one. If not, it's in the top five. Um, but uh, that's all I mentioned now. I don't want to talk too much. But uh, the, the legacy of the monitor, it's a fitting uh, end right here today to honor them in Arlington National Cemetery. And I'm very excited to be a part of it. So. Thank you. Um, now, Dr. Joe from Dr. Joe Hutner from GPAC, if you could introduce yourself and talk a little bit about your role within them. OK. Well, good morning, uh, or good afternoon, I guess. Aloha from Hawaii. Uh, my name is uh, Joe. I'm a forensic anthropologist for the Joint POW-MIA Accounting Command, and uh, specifically I work for the Central Identification Laboratory. Uh, JPAC's mission is the uh, search for recovery and identification of unaccounted for service members from past conflicts. And so our role um, is just that. We go out, we search for, uh, and that may be historical document searches, it might be uh, actual legs on the ground, uh, or in this case, in the water, searching for um, for crash sites, searching for uh, missing service members, and then those remains are brought back to the laboratory uh, following the recovery when they go through the identification process, which I'll uh, I'll speak about uh, in just a few minutes. Uh, I'll try not to go into too much uh, too much detail. Um, so JPAC is the uh, the Central Identification Laboratory, uh, the branch of JPAC that's responsible for identifications, is uh, the largest anthropology uh, laboratory in the country. We hire uh, and have on staff more forensic anthropologists than anywhere else. And so our uh, we're in a very unique position uh, to conduct identifications. And um, so for the USS Monitor, our, our um, role was two-part. We were involved with the identification with NOAA and the U.S. Navy and the Mariners Museum. Uh, Dr. Eric Emery was on site. He's one of our underwater archaeologists, and uh, or he was. And his, his responsibility was to properly uh, document the contextual um, location of the bodies. So he was interested in where the bodies were positioned. Can we tell anything about the positions of the bodies? And can we use that for the identification process? And so during the excavation, he treats it just like you would an archaeological site. There's a very uh, careful excavation inside of the turret to document the position of the two individuals. Once the recovery is completed, the remains came back to the laboratory and uh, where the analysis was conducted by Dr. Robert Mann, uh, one of the preeminent forensic anthropologists in the country and uh, the director of the Forensic Science Academy here at JPAC SEAL. And his analysis told us quite a bit about the two individuals. Um, the first individual I'll speak of was the younger of the two. And he was uh, 17 to 24 years old and uh, been five foot seven in life and was a white male. Now, the uh, evidence of, of uh, trauma that we noted uh, included things like a broken nose when he would have been alive because there was evidence of healing, and also a uh, fractured femur. And the femur was fractured in such a way that it's what we call a tug lesion. It looks like the muscle, instead of fracturing the bone, the muscle was actually pulled off of the bone, and it leaves a, uh, a little bony knob there. So we can use those to further develop our biological profile as we're, as we're conducting our identification. The second individual was a, a slightly older uh, white male, 30 to 40 years old, and um, he had uh, what we call a, uh, a pipe mouth uh, formation. He was a uh, he smoked pipes, 
and uh, the pipes back then were ceramic uh, stems, and so it actually had worn a groove into his uh, central incisors. And so, you know, it's, it's those kind of little individualizing characteristics that really bring to life uh, the, the remains and actually help us to put a face onto uh, the individuals that we're looking at. And as uh, some of you may know, we actually literally put a face on them using a facial reconstruction uh, process. And those uh, photographs are available online also uh, if you'd like to see them. Uh, but uh, JPAC is very excited to be uh, part of uh, the ceremony today and uh, looking forward to any questions that you might have and we can go into more specific details about the identification process and, uh, and what kind of where we are as of right now. So I'll, uh, I'll go on mute and I will uh, await uh, questions. Thanks. Thank you, Dr. Hubbard. Um, and first, yeah, Hello, my name is Jennifer Lynch and I'm the Public Affairs Officer at Arlington National Cemetery. And I'm going to talk to you today about what's going to happen at Arlington National Cemetery today. Um, this is going to be a full honors uh, funeral service. And what that involves is uh, a, uh, a casket team, a firing party, a bugler, escort troops, a colors team, a band element and a caisson. And uh, just to kind of talk about what that is, um, the, the first thing that you're going to see um, if you're here or if you come to a full honor service at Arlington is um, the caisson um, coming down to the to the gravesite location. The, the, the two unidentified sailors from the monitor are going to be um, buried in section 46 which is across from the Memorial Amphitheater next to the Challenger um, and the other, um, the, there's some, the mass, the main is near there and, uh, and that's where the, where the service is going to take place. One unique thing about, um, that's different at Arlington National Cemetery than in, at another military cemetery is that we do uh, full honor graveside services. So today, um, if, you're, if you're here, if you're going to be coming to uh, see the service, you're going to see the caissons coming down, uh, down the road. And the caissons, regardless of whatever service is um, the, the, vet, the service member or veteran was in, um, it will always, the caissons are always um, handled by the old guard. That's the 3rd Infantry Battalion here at Arlington. So you'll see the caisson come down, and it'll be um, leading the caisson is the um, band element and the colors team and the escort troops. And those are all um, there from the service member that, um, that has passed away. So in this case, it's, they were sailors, so it's the Navy. Um, so the, the caisson comes down. Um, you, have the, you have the escort troop and the colors team. They come over. And then you have um, the casket team. And the casket team does the dignified transfer of the remains from the caisson to the gravesite. And then when, once that has occurred, it's, um, it's taken over to um, the gravesite. And the flag is over it. And so um, the flag is folded. You hear three rifle volleys. And that's not a 21-gun salute. A lot of people think that's a 21-gun salute. Um, it's a three rifle volleys. Usually in a formation for um, a, a, a firing party is seven, seven service members from the parent service, but it doesn't have to be. Um, but they fire the three rifle volleys. Um, they hear taps. A bugler plays taps, and, that's, and, and it's the Navy, the Navy band is providing the bugler. The flag is folded and then presented to the next of kin. And that's, that is the, the process. Um, that full honors are conducted at Arlington. Now, um, the, the people that are eligible for full honor burials at Arlington are um, based, it's usually based on, determined by rank. So if you are a colonel, I mean a, an officer, um, you're eligible for full honors. Um, chief warrant officers are eligible and enlisted, enlisted personnel that are um, that reach the highest rank in that in that um, in the enlisted rank. Why is the monitor being given that full honors? Well, that's because it's an active duty death. All active duty deaths 
are um, killed in action are awarded full honors, regardless of their rank. And so that's why today um, that we're honoring them in that in this this way. The after the there the two this what's what's also unique about this. Uh, service is that there's two caissons, and usually we see one, but there's going to be two caissons for this service, um, and two flags that are going to be folded, and um, and they're and they're going to be buried side by side, and then over um, there'll be a group, a government group marker that has the name of all 16 that uh, that lost their lives that um, when the ship sank, and so their names will all be um, memorialized on that as well. So um, if anybody has any question. Um, we actually do have one that I think may have just answered it, uh, but are other sailors from the USS Monitor buried at Arlington? There are, there are actually three sailors buried at Arlington that survived the, the sinking. Okay. Um, I don't have their names, but we can, um, we can shoot that out after this hangout. But there are three, and on them, and, they're in, and they're, all three are buried in Section 1, I believe. And one of them has on their head on their headstone the monitor, you know. And it, and there's a rear ab one that made rear admiral, I believe. So um, we initially didn't think there was anyone buried here um, from the monitor, but we found that through some research that there are three. Okay, so we have a couple other questions um, from fans on our Google Plus page. Um, what steps were taken during the last decade to track down the descendants? I was under the impression there was a list of people it could be, the genealogist could not find descendants and do a DNA test. But I believe that question is for um, Dr. Huffer. Um, you're going to have to repeat the question. I was having a hard time hearing you. Okay. The question was from a fan, what steps were taken in the last decade to track down descendants? They were under the impression there was a list of people it could possibly be, um, and could genealogists not find the descendants and do a DNA test? Okay, yeah, that, that's a, that's a great question, and it's something that we uh, we do deal with, uh, you know, not only for the monitor remains but for um, other service members as well. Uh, for the monitor remains in in particular, we we have obviously a closed population, sixteen individuals, right? So uh, based on that, we could get family reference samples for all 16 individuals if you can locate them, if you can track them down. Uh, because the remains were uh, in salt water for 150 years, uh, DNA, uh, DNA can break down, it can degrade. Uh, however, the desal desalination process that the remains went through after they came to our lab will, uh, has helped us uh, in extracting a, uh, a reference sample. Family reference samples, however, uh, take a lot more time. You do have to locate a family member who is truly related to the in individual and is willing to provide a family reference sample for us. And uh, so our historians and uh, AFDIL, the Armed Forces DNA Identification Laboratory, uh, works hand in hand in locating and uh, obtaining family reference samples and the same is taking place for uh, the monitor remains. We have them right now narrowed down each one of them to less than five individuals uh, which is still uh, that sounds great but it still uh, puts us kind of behind the curve so we are always uh, looking for additional family reference samples if, if anyone has uh, as a, uh, a relative that they believe was on the monitor, uh, we would uh, welcome an email from you uh, uh, saying such, and we can we can actually send a DNA extraction kit to you. I hope that answers the question. Thank you very much. Um, I have another question, and I'm not sure who this is directed to on the panel. Um, why the difference between the way USS Arizona and USS Monitor are treated? Arizona is left alone as sacred ground, Thou shalt not touch, and the monitor has not. I can probably okay. take that one. Um, so I think part of the reason that we uh, actually went out and recovered artifacts, um, including the turret, the propeller, and the engine from the monitor, is that the monitor sank 151 years ago. Um, you know, the USS Arizona uh, is is made out of steel, not iron. I believe is is correct. So. Um, when you have a, a wreck that's been, an iron wreck that's been sitting in salt water, 
you know, 230 feet deep uh, for 151 years, uh, it's going to break down. And so uh, our goal, you know, with the National Marine Sanctuary, um, you know, in partnership with the Navy and with the, uh, uh, the Mariners Museum in uh, Newport News, was to, uh, you know, not let that resource, that, that uh, artifact, that, um, that history crumble essentially before our eyes. You know, we had found the wreck, we had done studies of it, tested the corrosion rate, and in 2002 with the turret recovery, um, our scientists said, you know, we have, to, we have to bring this up or it's going to crumble away. We're going to essentially lose this this piece of our history. Um, so while you know we value the the um, you know the we respect the remains and um, do as little as, as little disturbance of the wreck as possible, um, the decision was made that you know we really need to recover these and bring them to a place where we can conserve and restore them. Uh, and and now display them as well, so the public can continue to, um, to get to to learn these stories, to learn about the monitor, um, so we can share this with with uh, with the public. And so now, currently at the Mariners Museum, they have this uh, really wonderful conservation lab. Uh, the turret is in there. Uh, it's in a huge tank, uh, and they uh, have really elaborate processes that they go through to uh, ensure that it's uh, being restored to the, hopefully to the point that it will be eventually put on display. It's currently, you can kind of, uh, you can see it, you know, you can see through the windows of the conservation lab. Um, the propeller is currently on display in the museum. It's really uh, a really cool artifact. Um, they uh, have worked on the engine too. Um, and and again, if you if you go on our website and or or the the monitor the Mariners Museum website, you can see pictures of the, the preservation and, and the restoration process. Just the the gunk and the rust and the crud that was all over these artifacts uh, when they came up is really incredible. So um, they have a really talented group of, of archaeologists and um, preservation specialists there who have been able to take these uh, artifacts that would have uh, essentially rusted away to nothing and instead brought them to a place where they can be shared with the world. Um, for those of us not as um, knowledgeable about parts of USD, can you explain what the turret was and why it was so important to keep that, that, that particular piece of the ship? Sure. Do you, do you want to talk about the, the turret? Uh, yeah, I can. I mean, I guess anybody can. Um, the, the turret was the first of its kind. Um, the, it is protected by, and talking about ironclads, um, the CSS Virginia was also protected by, by iron, but talking about the monitor itself, the, the turret itself was protected by eight one-inch pieces of iron. Um, and just the fact that it's a rotating turret, remember that we have gone from the period called the Age of Sail. Right, that's everything from years, hundreds of years back, all the way up till 1862. And really, March 8th, the, the the day of the battle, the first day of the battle, Hampton Roads, that a lot of people uh, don't talk about necessarily. That's the the worst Navy disaster, U.S. Navy disaster, uh, until Pearl Harbor. Over 120 people die in the sinking of the the Cumberland, the the wreck of the Congress that will eventually explode later that day. Um, and uh, my train of thought, but the, the monitor itself talking about uh, the turret is the first of its kind uh, to be able to have a rotating turret. And so the Cumberland and the Congress, getting back to that, they are sailing ships. They're the ones that, that fire broadsides. So when we think of these big iconic battles of naval history, Trafalgar, the Nile, these are all done um, by you know ships that are either crossing the T or anything like that. Well, that all comes out, uh, blows out of the water with you. or uh, subsequent battleships, either pre-dreadnoughts, dreadnoughts, or you know, things like the main, we just mentioned that, the masses here at Arlington, um, it's, it's the first of its kind. And I think that uh, talking about icons in U.S. naval history, Monitor and its turret, and Ericsson's design especially, is something that needs to be preserved. And hopefully, like Matt said, we'll be able to see it uh, beyond just the glass at Mariner someday.
Yeah, and a funny funny fact about the monitor uh, turret was that it was so heavy. It was it was intended to be able to turn one way, fire, turn another way, fire. It was it was so heavy that the uh, amount of time it took to stop rotating and turn back around was so great that the guys in the turret just kept it spinning. Like they, it would take way too long to get it to slow down the momentum and turn back the other way to fire in another direction. So they were in there literally just yeah. with the turret going around for four hours when they were, yeah, when they were fighting the Virginia. Yeah, yeah, but, it's, on, it's, it's uh, yeah. If I could Mark. throw, uh, if I could throw one or two things in from a, a Navy technology and strategy standpoint, uh, obviously the ironclad making it more defensible and the fact that you have a rotating gun. Why that was significant from with respect to our entire fleet, instead of being reliant on the, the depth of water you're in, the direction of where the wind was coming from, all of a sudden our forces now had the ability to, to harness uh, the weapon system to their platform and not the other way around, that they'd have to sail and maneuver around the weapon. So what that allowed us to do is start thinking in terms of, you know, you talk about force multipliers and a lot of people talk about the most powerful fleet in the world. Part of the reason today's fleet is so significant and so powerful, even though we don't have as big a force as we used to, is because of this type of technology where you can do a lot uh, based on the delivery system, based on the radar systems, everything else. And the monitor's turret was that for the day. The ship didn't have to move around the weapon system. The weapon system uh, made the ship much more capable, even though it was a single hull. So uh, that's why it's iconic, and that's why it was so significant to the shaping of our fleet, even to this time. Um, we have another question from the fans um, following along on Google Plus. Are there other USS monitor sailors still unaccounted for? And if so, will there be any future attempts for recovery? Have yeah, uh, yeah, there are. Uh, so 16 sailors were lost uh, with the uh, sinking of the USS monitor. Uh, only two have been recovered. Uh, they're the ones in the turret that we are honoring today. Um, we don't know necessarily where the rest are. Um, again, this wreck is in 230 feet of water. That's that's really deep. Um, so it's not easy for for divers to get down there. Um, and you know, this is a wreck we want to treat with the respect that a um, that, that a, a grave site deserves. So. Um, it's you know there are not plans currently to to do any more uh, excavation or, or, or recovery of, of the um, of the vessel. So you know at, at present um, we we have these two uh, sailors from the wreck and there who we're honoring. Well, they call it Graveyard of the Atlantic for a reason. I think it's the, the the location of it. Yeah. Okay. Um, another question from a fan. Um, 151. Years is a long time. Can we walk through the timeline? And I think this may be for um, Dr. Hefner as far as how long it took us to um, first identify the sailors and then the excavation of the entire turret and then in the, in finding the sailors. Dr. Okay. Joe, could you walk us through the timeline as far as you know when you received the remains and how long and the steps that were necessary? I, I will do my best. Um, so our initial involvement was with in the with the 2002 excavation. Uh, we received the remains on 7 August um, and 21 August 2002. Um, the the I, I I kind of mentioned it earlier, but our desalination process, which is basically where we take all of that salt out and replace it with uh, with fresh water, and then allow the bone to dry. Um, that that process, so that we are not uh, putting the bone in any danger uh, and not causing more damage to the bone takes about eight months by itself. Uh, so uh, starting in August uh, 2002, you're already up into August, or excuse me, to uh, February 2003 before we're even actually able to lay the remains out in our, on our laboratory floor and begin the uh, this kind of slow process of, of, of building up what we call a biological profile. So for each individual, uh, we establish uh, a set of parameters that helps us uh, narrow down the number of individuals that we're looking at for um, for the identification. Uh, during that process, we do uh, take a DNA sample and submit it to AFTL. Uh, their backlog and their uh, just general workload uh, puts us about eight to ten months out before we even receive the results from them. 
uh, during that time period, our analysts are able to go through the uh, through the skeletal analysis, um, and so the entire. And also, at the same time, we have our historians and um, and our uh, research and analysis uh, group looking into the loss incident, trying to track down family reference samples. Uh, so all of this is kind of running concurrently. And then at that point, the identification, if we have a family reference sample, and if that family reference sample matches the DNA sample that we have uh, for the individuals, um, if we can match all of those up, the process can take anywhere from uh, one year to multiple years. Um, and as, as it stands right now, the two individuals from the monitor remain unidentified. Uh, if they are identified, and this is something that uh, the folks from Arlington can address, I, I assume if they are identified, then their headstones will be changed to, uh, to reflect the named individuals uh, resting uh, in Arlington. So the process literally can take anywhere from six months to ten years. They would, I'm not sure how they would handle it. They would either, because it's, it has a group marker with all the names, so they would either order an individual headstone for those two individuals, or they would somehow annotate it, annotate it on, a, on the group marker that the remains are there. Are there. Does that make sense? Yeah. That, so it, they, they can handle that a couple different ways. Um, and is anyone else able to walk us through the timeline as far as excavating the turret in a way? Is rolling that? Well, okay. So actually, bringing the turret up was uh, a forty-one day mission. So I mean, they, that that alone was just a remarkable achievement. I mean, the the fact that they could bring it up. This, there, so much had to go right for that to work that it was it was really incredible that it that it happened at all. Um, you know the weather had to stay good in, uh, as Matt said, the uh, area known as the graveyard of the Atlantic, where there are incredible numbers of wrecked ships from throughout naval history. Um, so you have out there this really elaborate expedition, multiple boats they set up. Uh, it's really uh, the, the pictures of it are, are incredible. Um, they, they're, uh, they set up these big sort of, um, I can't even really describe them, but it's, uh, it was really a remarkable effort to, to bring it up. Um, the, uh, so the mission took 41 days. They brought it back. Um, I don't know exactly how long it took to clear the turret out. I do know it was completely full of mud and silt and sand and sediment. So um, I imagine it was a pretty slow process. Um, uh, Dr. Heffernan was saying that it, it, it was treated as an archaeological archaeological excuse me um, dig essentially uh, excavating the the um, remains of the the sailors in the turret as well as uh, clearing the debris around the cannons because the cannons were um, uh, were there as well. So um, so I don't know the exact timeline, but it was it was a really uh, substantial effort to to get that cleared out. So it was a number of years too before they went from excavation two thousand two to actually be open the monitor center, I believe two thousand six or two thousand eight. Yeah, two thousand eight yeah, yeah, is when they opened the monitor center. So um, yeah, and if you live anywhere near uh, Newport News, uh, Virginia, you, you and are a Civil War buff, you have 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 to go to the Mariners Museum and check out the the USS Monitor Center. Um, they have a life size replica of the USS Monitor that you can go out and walk around on the deck of. Um, you can you can see the the turret being conserved. You can see. Uh, a pretty uh, incredible video theater that's uh, essentially a 360 video theater that uh, gives you a glimpse of what life would be like for sailors inside the, the turret of the monitor. Um, you should definitely also check out uh, the uh, uh, Hampton Rose uh, Naval Museum as well. Um, but you know, it's a really a great area for, for Civil War uh, uh, resources. Now, I'll, I'll uh, if I could just jump in again. Also, um, the the uh, JPEG's involvement in the excavation uh, we broke into two phases. We had an underwater phase that lasted from 26, 26 July to four August. 
Uh, there was not much actually uh, done during that period. There was some documentation, and then once the turret was up, we uh, kind of switched into this terrestrial phase that uh, that uh, we were talking about earlier. And the excavation of all of that silt from inside of the turret uh, took uh, this is these are long days, long hours. Took uh, uh, from 26 August to 30 August, uh, so four days. Now that sounds like it's very fast, but you have to understand this is a, a very contained area, and so we're working uh, basically with small uh, hand tools. Uh, some some people like to use credit cards because they cut just a little bit of soil, but they don't damage the bone. Because our intent is to completely expose the remains in their original position and leave them in that position so that we can start reconstructing kind of what happened to these two individuals. And so the, the maps that uh, Dr. Emery created. Uh, do a very nice job of showing the relative position of these two individuals inside of the turret, uh, kind of in their final resting place uh, until excavation. Thanks. Thank you. Um, Dave Warner, would you like to give a little bit of information um, as far as if fans want to find out more about just general naval history, where to go, and, and how to access that information? Well, sure. I mean, uh, we've already talked about that the, the real value is going to those museums down in, in uh, Hampton Roads area and touching history, obviously online, uh, you know, through Google, through any search engines that you find, you can pull things up. The, the Navy does have a pretty extensive web page for all the archives, including things on Monitor. Uh, if you go to uh, history.navy.mil, you can call some things up. We've got a couple of resource pages with uh, lots of images and uh, uh, information that we made available. I know that the U.S. Navy on everything from Facebook to the Navy.mil page has a ton of recent resources. And, and again, uh, for me, kudos to the group here and the, the teams and the organizations that have put all this together in part because pushing this out to the public in news channels, on the web, in magazines, in museums, and edu in education uh, services to to uh, school kids and everything else, getting people to understand the service of these sailors in that time and, and today, really, and the importance of Navy and our technology and our fleet to keep our interests uh, going, it all starts and ends with understanding our history as a maritime nation. So um, whether you do that on the computer, whether you go out and touch it for real in these, in these museums and the museums all over the country, uh, and on dives, you know, where people have an interest to do that, remember that these, you know, the one place we'd ask people not reach out and touch history are in these, uh, in these honorable grave sites, and that's what they are. So, you know, uh, respect history, uh, res but also respect the service members who, uh, who have those final resting places, and uh, come see history where you need to see it up here uh, with the rest of the living world. So that's, uh, hopefully that's helpful. Thank you very much. Um, Dr. Hefner, can you give us a little bit of information about where people could learn more about JPAC's mission and what and the incredible work you're doing down in Hawaii? Absolutely. Uh, if you are interested in kind of learning more about the JPAC mission, you can go to jpac.paycom.mil, uh, or you could swing over to our Facebook page and uh, and get some information from there. And uh, you know, if if you have any information about um, uh, unaccounted for service members, if someone from your family is unaccounted for, uh, we do uh, welcome family reference samples all of the time. So uh, please, uh, you know, contact us. We'd love to uh, love to hear from you. And I uh, just want to say thank you very much for including me in uh, in the process today and in the uh, Google Hangout. It's been uh, very enjoyable. So thank you. Um, and Jennifer, with Arlington National, I know you have some of valuable resources. Yeah, we have um, on our website, uh, www.arlingtoncemetery.mil, M-I-L. There's a number of resources available on our website that explain military honors, um, eligibility to be buried at Arlington, as well as um, a robust photo collection, if you want to look at photos. And uh, we also have links to our social media pages. We're active on, on we just opened a Google Plus account, so please go on our site. You can get it directly from our website um, in the social media section of our, of our page, as well as Facebook and Twitter and Flickr. So um, we also have uh, something that we just started, and it will take some time to add the monitor information but we have an app that you can, it's free to use, you can use it over your web browser 
or you can download it on your phone for free. Um, it supports Android and um, Apple and Blackberry actually. We do Blackberry as well. Um, it's called ANC Explorer and what you can do is um, when you, if you want to come and visit um, the group marker for the monitor, if you want to come here, it'll give you uh, directions um, from the visitor center, welcome center, or the parking lot that you can walk right up to the gravesite and see it and pay your respects. You can look up uh, your loved ones. Um, if you have someone buried here that you're interested in learning, exploring the rich history of Arlington, um, you can do that on this app as well. So that's available um, on our website, uh, links for that. Um, but we encourage you to come out if you, if you haven't been to Arlington. Um, we have over 400,000 heroes and their families buried here. Thank you. Yeah, we have a whole bunch of stuff. If you just go to our website, hrnm.navy.mil, uh, you can catch us on Facebook and Twitter, and then we also have a blog both for the Hampton Roads Naval Museum, .blogspot.com, and then the one that I run for the Civil War Navy sesquicentennial, civilwarnavy150.blogspot.com. Uh, you'll be able to, to get all the informa uh, information out there. We also have on the Naval Museum's website uh, the USS Cumberland Center, which is an interpretive center um, that one of our historians, Gordon Calhoun, uh, has created for the museum. So if you want to know about the first day of the battle uh, that I talked about earlier in all things Cumberland, definitely uh, go to that one. Um, yeah, so last year being the uh, 150th anniversary of the uh, birth, life, and, and sinking of the monitor, um, we created a, uh, a really elaborate website uh, to tell the entire story of the monitor. You can find that at monitor.noaa.gov N -O -A -A slash 150th, that's 150th. Um, and you can find the National Marine Sanctuary System online at sanctuaries.noaa.gov. And uh, we're on Facebook and Twitter, and uh, we'd love to have you follow us and uh, stay up to date with our content. Thank you. Um, and finally, this is Sandy Ball from um, Chinfo. We'd like to give you a couple of resources to find out more information. Um, for the remainder of the ceremony, so we'll be live tweeting at US Navy. Um, you can also find out a variety of different blogs um, on all naval subjects, but particularly about USS Monitor at our Navy Live blog. So quick Google search for that. And we'd like to thank everyone for joining, especially Joint Base Meyer Henderson Hall for hosting this great event. Thank you. Bye. Bye.